We're ready for the first presentation. Um, Michelle Young is also celebrating her reunion um, <laughs> class of 2012. So we're so happy to have her. She's also on faculty. And maybe Michelle, you want to tell us about your current projects and a little bit of yeah. uh, how you contribute to the academic life here? Sure. Um, I guess to say that GSAP helped launch my career is sort of even an understatement, and I've been involved in, in many different fronts. Uh, so I started at GSAP um, in 2009. I actually just took a random class there, wondering if I wanted to go to grad school. Uh, the answer was yes. Uh, and then I did the New York Paris program. Uh, I don't know if anyone here was part of that, but I did that from 09 to 10 and then started the Urban Planning Masters uh, 2010 to 12. So yes, it's my 10 year anniversary and I just realized that <laughs> this morning. Um, and then I've been teaching in the architecture program in the New York Paris program since 2014. So that's also nearing a 10 year reunion. Um, also on the professional side, I was in the GSAP incubator from 2016 to 17. And if anyone remembers that, it was an incubator space in the new museum, uh, and it's now um, a grant program. So no physical space, but it was very exciting to be a part of that when we could physically be together. And then I've been on the alumni, the GSEP alumni board since 2019. Um, and then other random stuff I've done for Columbia. We did a podcast during the pandemic. We made a guide for Columbia Magazine that was illustrated. Um, and yeah, so that's that's the Columbia family. It kind of ropes you in and never lets you go. But uh, was ex I'm extremely happy to to be part of it and, and see where where it goes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Untap New York, which is actually founded while I was at GSAP. So I was inspired to start it after I took the, that one class. Um, and the idea behind it was to show New York in in a different light, um, really to on a conceptual side to bridge the gap between um, the academic discussion of cities, which is very robust, but kind of stays in the schools often or stays on our hard drives and computers. All that research just gets kind of lost after and then transform that into a way that the, the popular, um, the general public can, can consume that. Um, so hold on, let me scroll. Oh yeah, here's my Twitter if anyone wants to connect. <laughs> um, and so today, Untap New York, after we started it in 2009, is has like three things that we do. It's a web magazine, which is how it started. Um, we do tours of New York. Uh, these are often like the secrets of places or access into off-limits places. And we have a membership program for our most hardcore uh, fans. We call them insiders. And then here we give them truly, truly off-limits access to places that are usually not open to the public. Um, and through our press relationships and other um, architecture urban planning relationships, people will open the doors to that. Um, it also gives members an opportunity to uh, meet the people behind uh, who are shaping New York City. Um, so I wanna give a little um, background on how the kind of the early stuff that I covered at Untapped, which I've, I'm still very proud about. So um, I believe there were some GSET people involved in this, but in 2009 in an empty lot in Bushwick, a bunch of architects created a mini golf course uh, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So um, I brought a bunch of friends, we documented it. Um, so that was, I think the first article, the second one was, one was about Fresh Kills Landfill, which is now the park uh, ongoing project, which will continue into 2030 and, and beyond. Oh, here it is, Fresh Kills Park. So this is what it looked like in 2009 before they really started anything. They had capped um, uh, the, the landfill and we're doing methane capture. Um, and so it was a very raw space, uh, but with great views uh, all the way to New York, New York City, um, to Manhattan, I mean. Um, and they say you can see Fresh Kills Landfill from space. So that and the wall of China. Um, some of the early things we covered was also Manhattan Henge, which is this phenomenon when the sun aligns with the Manhattan street grid, which is angled, uh, not exactly east-west. So, it, and it happens um, twice a year. Um, another spot that um, I was dying to go to back in 2009 or so was the City Hall subway station, which is decommissioned. A lot of people call it abandoned. It has a curved platform, which is why subway cars today, which are longer than when the subway launched in 1904, um, are unable to be platformed there. The curve in Union Square, for example, is less angled. And so that still exists, but they have those little things that pull out so that you don't fall in. 
Um, and then uh, back to the urban planning head. Uh, this was one of our earlier uh, articles that went viral. So I wrote this, uh, somebody's hiding a plane in Bushwick and this was a Google map image. And of course it's just a plane that happened to fly over, um, but kind of perfectly placed within Bushwick houses. So it looks like someone was hiding a plane. Um, and then another map project, this was done by a student at Columbia, a friend of mine in urban planning, Charles Antoine Perot. And he decided to overlay the Manhattan street grid onto, uh, sorry, the Paris street grid onto Manhattan um, to try to destabilize our notion of what is New York City. Um, so this was also a viral, um, a viral moment. Uh, another article I was proud about early on that I wrote while I was at, in, at grad school um, was about Jane Jacobs house, which is in Greenwich Village. And the point of this article was the fact that it was this store glassy baby, which was selling $40 cups. Um, so the real contrast between a person who wanted to uh, reinvigorate the street life, save it, um, uh, and then kind of what happens <laughs> kind of accidentally when um, neighborhoods change, despite best efforts. Uh, okay, so now how's it going? <laughs> so this is a screenshot of what, uh, what we were covering recently. So we publish about two, three articles a day. We have a database of over 10,000 articles and a huge number of photographs. Um, but this Times Square project for Pride Month is happening right now. It's an augmented reality project. Um, we also covered the freight tracks uh, that are might become the new Interborough Express line. So that's a big initiative from the governor. Um, and so we looked at what uh, the freight tracks look like now and in, the, in previous years. We're doing a talk soon from somebody who's a descendant of a meatpacking district company called Ottoman and Company, Ottman and Company. Um, here we go. So here's some closer ups. And then we cover things like secrets of neighborhoods. Um, we recently had this piece about uh, an Upper West Side church on 86 and, and Amsterdam that might be demolished. Um, and then other popular things include filming locations. Um, so we did Russian Doll recently, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And then you get a glimpse of some of our events that we host. So we're doing a tour of TWA Hotel. Um, today, people are going in, we're bringing people into the Glenwood Power Plant in Yonkers, which was originally part of the railway, Metro, what became Metro North, and it was a Con Ed facility. And now it's being turned into a very magnificent um, climate change facility, research facility, uh, and it's designed by Bjarke Ingels. Well, the, the redesign will be. Uh, so some of the tours I mentioned earlier, but um, again, the aim is to show people the secrets and hidden gems of New York. So here's what's a little taste of what's going on. I mentioned the Ellis Island hard hat tour, um, but another popular tour is our subway tour, remnants of Penn Station. Uh, that's a particular favorite of mine because I had been writing about what was left of the original Penn Station by McKim, Mead and White that still exists. And we give this tour, we've taken thousands of people, sometimes begrudgingly, uh, uh, we take people who take the train into Penn Station and complain about it and tell us that they now see the whole station in a different light. Uh, we launched this Fifth Avenue Gilded Age Mansions tour this year uh, in conjunction or timed with the, the new series Gilded Age on, on HBO. Um, and then, we don't need to go through this. This is from our media kit, but I think what's interesting is that um, almost all of our, over 80% of our guests are New Yorkers. And that actually really helped us out in the pandemic when uh, tourism was uh, decimated. We actually had a very core audience of people that are from New York state and, and, and the surrounding region. Here are some photos of the Ellis Island tour. Definitely recommend going on that if you haven't been. Uh, the organization there, the nonprofit, is trying to save these buildings uh, before they uh, fall into dis true disrepair. And then I mentioned earlier <clears throat> our insiders program. Um, so here we are on the in the near public library on the catwalk that only employees are usually allowed to go on. So they took us up there. And then some of the events uh, that are coming up, or we just did. Um, we did a, we screened a video that um, looked inside the Washington Square Park Arch. Uh, and I got to go in there and bring some people in there about three years ago with Parks Commissioner Mitchell Silver. Uh, it's a fun story there because I interviewed him for a profile and he said, 
going into the arches on my bucket list. And I was amazed that people who work in government have a bucket list. I assume that they have access to everything. So I said that too is on my bucket list. So we went together. It brought our respective teams. Um, let's see anything else worth mentioning. Uh, and then this was a couple of months ago, but we went into Highbridge Tower, again, a partnership with New York City Parks. We also went into the Palace Theater in Times Square that's, that was just lifted. Uh, so we did this just before they lifted it, but they lifted it, I don't know if it's 30, 60 feet. Um, and it's, so it's a pretty wild redevelopment real estate project uh, in Times Square. Um, and then finally, I kind of wanted to share my top 10 moments that I've had in New York uh, doing this uh, business. Um, and so here I got to take an Osprey to go to the USS New York for Fleet Week. This was a few years ago as well. And then got to accompany this ship uh, come into New York Harbor under the Verrazano and to dock um, right at the Intrepid, right next to the Intrepid. So a really memorable moment. Some of you guys maybe have explored the High Line, this, the last section before it was turned to the High Line. I know that was a popular urban exploration spot, um, the last sort of untouched portion. Uh, here I am on the roof of the Flatiron Building. I went up with the superintendent and we also went into the basement. There's a really incredible steam uh, and power system that's down there. TW Flight Center in 2012 uh, worked with both the Port Authority and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The trust reached out to me saying that we, they wanted more publicity about TWA to help save it and to hopefully find someone to convert it into something. And now of course it's the hotel. Hopefully some of you have been in there. Um, some of you may have remembered Five Points, the graffiti uh, haven in Queens in Long Island City. So we went there as it was being demolished um, another tour we hosted for many years was a New Yorker hotel tour, which included a trip to the roof, which you, where you can see the iconic New Yorker sign. Um, a lot of underground exploration. So this is a trolley terminal that was never actually built under the Manhattan Bridge. And for a long time, a uh, kind of secret was that you could just pop open a little electrical panel or manhole right in front of the bridge and go in. And so um, friends of mine who host these kind of illicit parties coordinated um, several hundred people to have a party down there, which was, which was amazing. Uh, obviously it's been closed off since then. Um, brought my team down to the sub-basement of Grand Central. This is where the old rotaries are. Rumored that it was a target in World War II by the Germans. Um, because it controlled all of the tra train traffic up and down the East Coast. So the idea was that if they could sabotage this, they could prevent uh, troops and goods from going over to Europe. And then got to climb up to the spire inside 70 Pine uh, when it was um, being redeveloped as well. That's a skyscraper in downtown Manhattan. And this is the Explorer, also a very professional urban planner who works for the Regional Plan Association. Moses Gates, um, he, he's going up there. Um, and he has a mission to go through, go to all of the former abandoned, uh, sorry, the former observation decks in all of New York City, which were used to be open to the public. So his mission is to expose that and to kind of share why many of these public amenities have been closed over the decades, especially after 9-11, but they started to get closed way, way before that. Um, and the last thing um, that my husband reminded me of this morning was being able to escort the Tuskegee Airmen to Obama's inauguration. So another really special moment uh, for me. And then quickly kind of wanted to go through some of the things that I guess a background in urban planning or architecture assists in. So the US State Department reached out a couple years ago and said, we wanna bring a delegation of journalists from Egypt to learn about what you do. Um, so that was kind of nuts. They came to our office and we talked to them about local journalism, um, about cities. Um, so that was, that was really special. I got to speak at um, a sustainability conference at the UN. As you can see, I'm kind of one, well, you can't really see it, but I will tell you that I was one of only two women on this panel. Um, and then with Kate Asher, who many of you may know, who also teaches at um, in the real estate program at GSAP, we organize uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bellagio Conference on Jane Jacobs. So 
re highly recommend anyone just try to attempt to, to organize a conference there because it's amazing, as you can see. So you get to stay in those houses down by the river and have dinners up at the villa on top. And here are some of the people that um, came to the conference. So we had a bunch of GSAP people, um, Vishan Chakrabarty, who was there at the time. Um, so this was in 2012, maybe. So you'll see we actually had Carrie Lam, who um, you know, has come under a lot of pressure in Hong Kong, um, but Enrique Norte, the architect, um, Claire Weiss, um, Haley Soholt, who's uh, the founding partner of Gale Architects. So a lot of people who have become quite uh, well known, uh, well, we're well known then and, and even more so now. Um, and then I've done some documentary shoots for Smithsonian Channel. So here we were in a post office in Chelsea um, because there are remnants of the pneumatic tubes that were used for mail down there. And I'm just like, that's like my obsession. And I learned that from Kate Asher in, in 2009 and um, continues to be a real obsession of mine. Um, I was on Stephen Dubner's podcast, Tell Me Something I Don't Know, uh, also talking about pneumatic tube mail. Um, and then um, on the side, we published a few books. So we have Secret Brooklyn, which is a guidebook about um, secret places in Brooklyn. We did New York hidden bars and restaurants. Uh, I did a book about Broadway, about the history of it. And then um, the big news I have is that I just sold a book to HarperCollins uh, about a French resistance spy who was part of the Monuments Men, but was also a spy during the war from 1940 to 44 in France um, and was stationed in the museum where the Nazis were looting all of the stolen Jewish art through. Um, so she was there documenting everything. They didn't know that she spoke German. Um, and she has a very dramatic story. She was held at gunpoint several times, was kicked out of the museum and every time found her way back. Um, and then she worked with the monuments men who of course were art artists and architects who, who went on to save um, and locate the art, which she, she knew where, the, where it was. So they needed to get her, the monuments men were tasked with getting her information because she knew exactly where the art was shipped to in, in the mines of Austria, um, in the castles in Germany. Um, so that is, uh, I'll be working on, on that for the next few years and stepping away from my company. Um, so that's the exciting stuff that's going on right now. Oh, here are some photographs. So the top right is the museum, the Jeu de Bombe. It's just um, next to the Louvre. Um, and, the, and the Nazis wanted to use that so they, there wouldn't be any oversight about all the stuff they're stealing. And it's estimated that um, in total, about 600,000 pieces of art were stolen uh, in World War II. Um, a large number went through France uh, specifically. Um, and then Rose herself estimates that a third of the privately owned art in France uh, was stolen during this war. Um, one of her closest partners was um, the man holding what looks like maybe a camera in the bottom picture, Dreams Rormer, who eventually became the director of the Met. And so he was the one that um, got her information uh, about where everything was in, in Germany and Austria. And on the right, you can see right bottom, that's her Ausweis from, um, from the Nazis that enabled her to go to work every day. So... That's it. That's my quick presentation of um, what's, what's I, what I've been doing and how Columbia was, has been part of that. So Leslie, I don't know if there, you wanna take any questions? Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I wanna invite everyone to, um, anyone to ask questions if they have any, um, but in, as you guys are thinking about it, I just want to remind you that um, Untapped New York is also hosting our tour this afternoon from camp from this campus to the new campus up at Manhattanville. It's a really leisurely walk on a beautiful day. Um, and Michelle's company also, uh, we commissioned her company to do tours and podcasts for in the incoming class. Uh, during the pandemic when they weren't able to do orientation in person so that they did get a sense of the neighborhood surrounding Columbia. Um, and that's been a huge, also just a critical um, point for us and in, in terms of gathering the community. So thank you for that, Michelle. Yeah, of course. Do we have any questions? You're stepping away from your company for, for five years. What uh, are you no, I, I well, 
the book is due in 18 months, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Uh, the book publishing world works super fast. So they wanted it in 12. And I said, that's not possible. So I'm um, gunning for 18 months uh, so I can have two summers in France uh, to do this work. So I'm leaving at the end of the month for two months. My husband is French. Um, so it's sort of how I got, uh, I don't know. I was always been obsessed with World War II. My, my grandfather survived the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. He was a Taiwanese student in Japan during that time. Uh, he was like 16 years old. Um, and, um, but then when I married a French family, I started getting really interested in, um, the World War II history of France. Uh, it's very palpable, of course, when you go to Paris, there are plaques everywhere. Um, so started obsessively reading books and ended up on the very narrow genre of French, I'm sorry, of female World War II spies, which is apparently a subgenre. <laughs> um, and then came across this woman reading a book called Goring's Man in Paris, fascinating book. Um, it's about Goring's art dealer and um, who was working in the same museum and read about this woman. And for me, she literally popped off the page every time she showed up. And I was like, I need to know more about her and um, was shocked that no one had written anything about her. But I guess, you know, if you think about it, Monuments Men, <laughs> it just doesn't really include women. Um, so I thought it was a great story. So um, I wish I could have five years to work on it, but <laughs> I'll probably be away for two to three years, let's say. Hi, Michelle. It's Leah. Thank Hi. you so much for sharing all of this. I just yeah. had one quick question. I'm always curious how you decide what is featured for On Top New York. Where do your ideas come from? Um, That's a great question. Um, so what we tell our writers, contributors, uh, and we, we came up with this early on, actually, a uh, a friend of mine is an advertising executive in New York City, pretty well known, and she agreed to do a little session with us and it was super helpful. Um, and the thing we came up with then was that um, it has to answer the question, what in all capitals, question mark, exclamation, question mark, exclamation, you know. Um, if a topic, if something doesn't answer that or make someone feel that, um, then we shouldn't cover it. Uh, we also say that everything should be positive. There's, uh, of course, in the, in the last bunch of years, news has been, very intense, uh, but even before that, um, we realized that people do snarky news much better. And our goal here is to celebrate New York um, and uh, really have positive news out there. So if we don't like something, we just don't really cover it. We, we have had op-eds that are more about urban planning or city development in which we feel that we have an expert that can weigh in on that. Um, but also, again, not in a negative way, but in an informative way. Um, and so, yeah, it has to be surprising to, to even the most, uh, the New Yorker that thinks that they're truly a native New Yorker and knows everything, we, we try to surprise those people and then also surprise visitors as well. Okay, we're gonna get started. Um, Kaz Sakamoto is the class of 2013. He graduated from the UP program and teaches on the analytics track at GSAP now um, in the fall, excuse me, but he's also a doctoral candidate at EF, EPFL in, in Switzerland now. Um, he's gonna tell you a little bit more about his, his background, his current research pursuits, and his academic contributions to, to GSAP. Thank you, Kaz. All right, um, I'm really happy to be here with you all. Um, are there any urban planners, UP alumni? All right, um, so I guess I might be alone, but um, hopefully this is of interest to those of you who aren't planners. Um, so today I'll be just giving a brief um, introduction about who I am, um, what an urban digital twin is, if you haven't heard of digital twins in general, and then um, some research areas that I'm interested in. And then if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer that for you. So a little bit about myself. So I graduated from the UP program in 2013, and I've also been teaching at Columbia since 2014, kind of like Michelle. And actually, um, we have gone on some tours together. So I worked at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, and we did a really fun tour of the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. Um, so that's a property that's managed by the Economic Development Corporation. And that's mostly where a lot of the food comes from. So if you're interested in where all of the food comes to New York City, um, it happens in the South Bronx. 
Um, after that, I did a few years at Goldman Sachs um, working as a data scientist, and I've done consulting work for the World Bank, um, primarily on using algorithms to create a traffic accident database um, using tweets in Nairobi. And currently, I'm also working on a project with them, um, helping them to identify a, a vulnerability index in West Africa. And currently, I'm a doctoral candidate at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in Lausanne, Switzerland. And I'm in the Laboratory on Human Environment Relations in, the urban, in urban Systems um, and work with a very interdisciplinary team of energy engineers, architects, urban planners, urban sociologists. Um, and we're all trying to figure out how to um, transition towards a more sustainable urban environment. Some teaching examples that I've taught. So I've been teaching environmental data analysis with, with Peter Marco Tulio. Um, and this is working with environmental data and getting urban planners really used to working with more um, different types of scales. So one critical aspect that students wanted was to not just focus on New York City. Obviously, we're in New York City, but we try to do a national level, international, and also regional type of planning, um, as well as um, New York City based, and really give them hands-on tools um, using data, um, usually big data, raster analysis, machine learning, um, even a little bit of computer vision stuff. And then, in the middle, I've also taught prototyping for urban policy and decision making. Um, so this is really trying to put urban planners and urbanists in the realm of um, app prototyping. And so if planners were to create urban technology or apps, um, what kind of tools we would make? Um, currently, there's a lot of urban tech that's happening without, the, without planners actually really um, putting forth ideas, so it's kind of getting urban planning students to think about, okay, like what is, how would you successfully create an app, prototype it, um, and pitch an idea. Um, on top of that, I've, I haven't included every class that I've taught, but I've taught GIS for a very long time, and I've also co-taught um, planning methods. And I was also fortunate enough to do two summer workshops, so I'm from Hawaii, so both Summers, we were able to go back to Hawaii. One summer was about transit-oriented development um, with a new rail line that is being constructed um, around Honolulu. And then the second one was using an augmented reality app to do a parking study. And so comparing GPSs and tracking where uh, parking spaces are in one neighborhood um, with a new um, AR app that will actually survey the street for you and to compare how accurate and how quickly a new survey can be done. And the main issue in Honolulu is that there's a lot of cars. The development of Honolulu happened um, after World War II and it only became a state um, a little over 50 years ago. And so the development of Honolulu coincided with a lot of um, automobile-centric planning. And so parking is a big issue. Um, many of the parking spaces that we found were actually in um, buildings. And so many of the surface level parking that you see, um, people are competing for these places that they want to park as close to the businesses. Um, but there's actually a lot more parking than you need. And um, it also affects zoning, because right now, for every new apartment unit, you have to build one parking space. So for a developer, it actually is quite expensive um, because a parking space maybe costs 75,000 to 100,000 to construct each. And so for every bedroom that you need, because every material, concrete is expensive, you have to bring it to an island. Um, and so if we can reduce the amount of parking required in the zoning, it would actually make it a lot more, I would say, better for everyone. It lowers the cost of apartment because the you know, the consumer is going to be paying for that parking spot, whether they might not need it. And if you live in downtown Honolulu, you really shouldn't need a parking spot per bedroom. Okay, so that's a little bit about my background. Um, so here you can see um, many cities are now creating digital twins. Um, Barcelona, this was like a recent article, Zurich, Singapore, London. 
Um, even in Lausanne, we're building one as well. And New York, I believe there is one. People are really pushing digital twins to solve complex problems. So what can it do? Maybe solve climate change issues? Um, it's also going to disrupt industries. And so um, real estate, um, transportation, um, maybe a digital twin will help us um, transform these sectors. And maybe it'll also help us design better policies for policymakers and politicians and government officials. But I ask why are people so interested in urban digital twins? Um, it seems like everyone's starting to build one, and so this is kind of what I'm focused in on my PhD study. So you can see um, many technology firms are pushing um, urban digital twins through IoT solutions, so the Internet of Things, um, putting sensors, um, which coincides with a smart city. Um, Sidewalk Labs um, in Quayside had their um, project, which is now defunct, um, but they were calling the city as an API. So what should a, um, should a city be an API? What does that mean? Um, it's very uh, technocentric focused view of what a city should be. And even NVIDIA recently um, claimed that they're going to make a visual twin, or they're going to make a digital twin of the whole Earth, which is quite um, impressive. And maybe even getting into a simulated universe. So if you think about metaverse, um, meta, or what used to be Facebook, is now really pushing the boundaries of what our digital world and our virtual worlds are going to be. So technology. Um, really driving the need for maybe what a digital twin is going to be. So the digital twin is not unique to the urban planning or architecture field. It is said that the first digital twin was for the Apollo 13 mission. And so um, they had a simulator and it helped um, with the landing because they were able to do so many different types of simulations. Um, so I like the American Institute for Aeronautics and um, Astronautics definition, which is the set of virtual information constructs that mimics the structure, context, and behavior of an individual, unique, or physical asset. So it's a virtual construct. It's mimicking what, uh, what is the physical asset. And it should be dynamically updated, so there's a temporal aspect to it. Um, and it should be throughout its life cycle. So maybe you determine like how long that life cycle is. And this is a very product-focused um, view as well. And in Megatronics, it has a similar um, definition, a comprehensive physical and functional description of a component, product, or system, which includes more or less all information, which could be useful um, through life cycle phases. And so there's a non-exhaustive list um, of areas of use. So healthcare, I went to a digital twin conference. Um, you could create a digital twin of a heart. So if a cardiologist is working on um, a complex case, maybe you want to build a digital twin of someone's heart before you go into surgery. Um, retail, manufacturing, um, you could create a whole digital twin of a supply chain or just a factory. Um, even something as complex as an oil rig um, is something that's being done. Um, academics are interested in digital twins, logistics, construction. Um, so everyone is interested in what a digital twin can do. So what about an urban digital twin? So there's some people who are saying there's no consensus about what an urban digital twin is. And I would argue that there hasn't been a real true urban digital twin made as of yet. Um, but there should be a spatial scalability. And so you should be able to um, either go down to the building level, a neighborhood, a city, even a region, maybe even a globe. So it has to be spatially scalable. It also has to be integrated and uh, uh, synchronized to the real world. So that means that there has to be sensors and it has to be fed back into the model and so that it's updated in real time and so that you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between the physical asset and the digital asset. Some people also, for an uh, urban digital twin, say that it should be interactive and multi-user. And so it should be open um, access, it should be transparent. Um, and many people should be able to use it. It shouldn't be just a tool for yourself. And obviously the simulation and the modeling is also quite important um, because if you want to test something without having an intervention in the physical space, the digital space can allow you to do 
so, such things. And it should be modeled with, uh, as best as possible, physics. And so it's tied to real world um, physical laws as well. And so in the research fields, there's a lot of people who are interested in urban digital twins from urban planning, architecture, urban economics, ecology, engineering, sociology, political science, computer science. So we need all of these types of different researchers to be able to construct the urban digital twin because it is very complex and it has to be as real as possible. And cities are probably one of the most complex things and to understand it, it's going to require many um, disciplines and researchers. So cities are prime for digital twins because we already have smart cities, which was um, really pushed maybe like 10 years ago. A uh, smart city is pretty, it's not useful unless you do something with it. So we have now amassed all this data and you can access it. But I think the main issue and the drawback with the smart city was that it actually didn't tie all those layers together. And so when Bloomberg opened up the New York City open data portal, just because putting out data, it doesn't mean that you, it's interoperable. And so it takes a lot more work for someone to be able to connect trash or waste management data with parks or city blocks or um, any type of other metadata that you might find in a city. And so the natural progression, I would think, is to want to do something with all this data that is being collected. And so I think the digital twin is really a way that um, researchers and policymakers, anyone who's interested in working with cities, will be able to now understand what is coming out of this, um, this city. And I would say that primarily it's been very siloed. So you would see a lot of modeling happening in like um, traffic engineering, or maybe just the urban ecology part or the climate. And so now we can also see how do we layer um, all of these things together. And so the research project that I'm working on is called the Blue City Project. Um, it's um, in partnership with uh, Eteha in Zurich, uh, the uh, city of Lausanne and other industry partners. And so here we can see there's a few components that we have described, um, which might be just the material flow through a city the natural flow, the mobility flow, uh, flow of goods, waste flow, flow of utilities. I think one thing that we're missing in this diagram is people, um, but I didn't create this diagram. Um, but you can see that in, inside it's the platform that really allows people to then connect all of these different layers. And so now it should be in sync as real time as possible. And so if you want to see the interactions between all of these complex things that are happening within a city, uh, we should be able to, um, I guess, understand this better and the phenomena. So some ongoing research areas. So um, we work with a lot of sustainability. Um, I personally don't love the word um, because it's really hard to define. And um, some people think it's overused and it's this like kind of like greenwashing, um, but it is really, when I teach my sustainability assessment course at EPFL, I try to teach people that it's actually, we do an exercise with utopias and dystopias. And I say that um, when you think about a utopia, it's actually the definition of utopia is no place. And sustainability is also a journey. And so utopias are actually not a real place. It's something that you envision and sustainability is also like that. There's no you don't reach sustainability, it's something of a journey, and we all have to come together to think about what that means. Um, because there is a normative dimension, um, so everyone's different, on, it's context specific, people have different understanding of sustainability, and once there's no one size fits all solution when we talk about sustainability for cities. There's also the systemic dimension, and so many of it is baked into the system, and there's obviously the procedural, and all together, this creates the sustainable development ecosystem. Um, but within that, now um, moving from environmental economics into ecological economics, we have to think about our planetary boundaries and that are we, um, before, if within sustainable development, you could have the three pillars and you can offset or have trade offs between the environment, um, development, and um, the social well being. Um, but Obviously, we live in a finite world, and so we can't overstep what 
our environment or ecology has. And so we always have to now think about um, what is our ecological footprint and the economy has to fit within that. And so can we decouple some of these things? Um, that's the big question happening in economics. In terms of public participation, um, you have to wonder who is um, being engaged in the urban digital twin. And so Arnstein's classic ladder of participation um, from the lowest rung all the way to the top. And so this is another framework that can be used when thinking about how equitable and who is participating in the creation of an urban digital twin. Um, it's also going to push our urban theory. And so we went from Burgess's concentric zone model of understanding um, different uses of land based on the distance away from the city center. Um, now it's being challenged as transportation has changed the way that we move. And now um, information and networks, you can telework. I think during COVID, we really found out that our lives and how we live them have ultimately changed and maybe how you view your cities or where you even have to locate for work. Um, there's um, Kevin Lynch's image of the city and how we categorize different parts of the city. Um, and um, Mike Daddy's inventing futures. So can we even in, um, predict what a future is going to be when it's so complex for cities? And so his notion is that we can't predict the future of cities, but we can actually, we actually invent them. And so how much maybe free will or um, agency we have. And as today we're becoming more and more diverse from, divorced from function over form, um, we're going to see that information networks are shaping what cities used to be. And so now that we live in a global world, how do we even define what a city is? And in, in systems science, um, defining the boundary is quite important. And so depending on how we define what we want to study as a city, um, is New York City just a city or an island? Um, I think how we interact with the city and how we model it is also going to be different in the urban digital twin. And lastly, um, algor algorithmically infused cities so there's an emergency, emergence of societies whose very fabric is co-shaped by the algorithm and human behavior. And this is going to be very complex as we don't even understand how much of the algorithm is dictating our day-to-day -day life. And so here are some examples from this uh, um, article in Nature. Um, so the dating recommendations is one process and so who you're being fed to in terms of who you're going to match for a date is already um, filtered through an algorithm. The news that we see is already being filtered through an algorithm. And when we start out, um, automating all of these planning decisions through an urban digital twin, the how you live in a city is also going to be algorithmically determined. Um, and that has a huge impact on how you live your, um, in your city and we might not be able to even turn back what happens. So this is also something I'm interested in is to be able to maybe start to untangle how much of this, your day-to-day -day life is already algorithmically infused um, when you live in a city. So that's a bit about what I'm thinking about and working on for the next four years. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, so, you know, even in New York City, we have different planning processes like the Euler process. And it's oftentimes there's, n even in a neighborhood board, you don't have, or a community board, you don't have, you can go, but you actually don't have any say in terms of what happens to your neighborhood, right? And so you can say that it probably has really just like an informing type role. Um, so if you want like more power, then you have to go up the, this ladder of participation. And so these are, you know, like a discretized version of what like some people have, you know, 
this is a pretty really a good example, but or just to like um, just to um, I guess categorize levels of participation. And so in planning, you know, maybe you it depends on what kind of planning model you want to use, whether it's fully participatory or democratic, um, but there's different levels of reaching that. And so, you know, I, my interest is also in public participation and I focused on the digital divide. And so within, when planning processes move digitally, um, you're also going to lose a lot of people that aren't going to be interacting, um, maybe through websites or apps they're already not in the room. Um, yes. <laughs> when you put all that data in, so if you're an architect and you're working as Revit or BIM as Navisworks, or just looking at Planner, mm -hmm. is that all that's portable? Is it compatible? It should be. Yeah. I think there are some already models out there. And so if we were to build an urban digital twin and you do have all the components of buildings, I think that should be open for everyone, right? Because why just hoard that information? And so um, urban digital twins, um, part of it also comes from city information modeling, which is coming out of um, building BIM. And so it's kind of like, okay, like if we were to take the idea of BIM and then think about it at a city level, that's basically city information modeling. And that's kind of part of the, the foundations, I would say, of urban digital twins. It doesn't have every function, but I think it has a lot of important fa factors of the built environment, even the visualization of a urban digital twin. Um, but definitely a lot of the concepts of BIN feed into urban digital twins. Like new buildings with engineers when they're doing that thermodynamic modeling of use that chip, right? I mean, that's part of it mm -hmm. for the sustainability. Yeah, and this is all important because if you're going to have new developments or do public works, you're going to need all of this information about the city and the built environment, also um, what's underneath. So, you know, these are all things that should be available. Um, and if you do it once, right, the city has a lot of this information, like they should be able to provide that and make it more accessible. And if we really want to model the city, those are all components that I think are very important. So I think it's right now, many of the urban digital twins out there are for mobility and transportation. So it's also, you can see, how cities are prioritizing which parts of the urban digital twin they're going to build out first. And so in, in any digital twin creation in any field, they're all components. So you don't build one gigantic model, but you actually make each small component. And so when civil engineers create a digital twin of a wind turbine, um, they actually do just the wings or just the motor, and together then they can fit it together because creating one whole component of that um, wind turbine is just too much. But if you make it really small, um, then it'll actually be easier to model. And then eventually they have like different presentations where you can have many wind farms on the sea. And if there's a big wave, what is that going to do to all of these components, right? So we have to also start thinking more about what are the components that we want to model in the city? And then how do they fit together, right? And that's where maybe some people argue for um, social physics. Um, so can we predict some human behaviors? Um, because the human part is also very critical. Um, but in terms of the ecological or the energy or transportation, like those are all things that we can like understand a lot better, I would say. Yes. Research regarding the impact of the recent COVID-19 pandemic on the urban behavior and uh, you know, just in general how the landscapes are changing. I would say there was a lot of research that happened. Um, is there anything in particular about different types of behavior that you're interested in? Um, so like longer term staying trends um, in particular. Um, I guess like specific, is it like, um, I did a study on, like, 
on uh, critical infrastructure on COVID spread? I don't know. I mean, it, behavior is so big. So is it about like people moving away or spending patterns or anything in particular you were? Um, I think or social behaviors? Social or? behaviors as well as, um, um, yeah, I think social, social behaviors is probably. I'm sure there's a lot of study. That's not specifically my field, but I think you can definitely measure um, you know, it depends on how you want to measure it, and there's a lot of, I would say, social network analysis that's happening, um, but it also depends on what level. So individually, you might notice different things, and then at a larger scale, you might see other patterns, um, and I'm sure it really depends on cities, because in New York City, you really don't have as many options to do things. Um, so New York City is always kind of a unique case. And so I don't know if any findings in New York City are always so generalizable. Um, global scale, I'm not super sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we do research, we have to go through the IRB process. So if it ever involves human subjects, you have to go through a review process. Um, but honestly, like in the computer sciences and the engineering, it's less common. And so I would argue that there is lots of secondary use data that is happening. And so even though you primarily collect data for a specific reason, it doesn't really ban people from using it for other ulterior like motives, right? And so I would say that while as researchers, we, I, I would say we're not doing this for a profit or to harm people, um, but the, just the creation of this data or models can be used for bad or for malicious reasons. And that is something that we have to grapple with. Um, but honestly, there's not a perfect solution. Um, so in this computational social science realm, you know, there's the, ad hoc, like, you know, like people make decisions about how they want to work with ethics in the research or data process. There's a more rule base where we follow these like very old school um, IRBs, which was created from very legacy like use cases about like um, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. But now those are quite outdated. There's a lot more abuses that are happening with digitally derived data um, that I don't think we've really confronted quite yet. And so some people argue, like, maybe we just dabble in this gray area. Um, so there's a um, professor at Princeton, um, Matthew Salganik, and he thinks that it should be principles-based so that as a community, the more transparent we are about what we're doing, then people will be able to say, okay, that is not ethical or not. Um, one example, there was the Facebook emotional contagion study that got a really big backlash. And so they're actually suppressing positive or negative types of news on your Facebook and seeing how it affected your behavior on the app. And people were not, cons there was no consent. Um, so people thought it was unethical to be suppressing like positive news or positive messages or negative messages. And so this is really 
the realm of what we're now having to think about in terms of private companies, what is ethical in the digital um, environment as well. Yeah. Yes. In your proximity to the digital twins, in particular as it relates to cities and such, clearly it's very complex, right? Many different inputs, but both physical side and what is it you want to model, but it seems like a lot of it's driven by even here, like what are the inputs or the outputs you're seeking to target? What are the actual implications or like in the next five years, right? Like there's clearly been a lot in the next clip. So there have been simulations and done for decades, clearly, referencing NASA. Buildings have been doing these types of things for looking at agent-based modeling of people moving through spaces. But when you look at, like, say, the next five years, like, what do you see being the meta trends that carry forward where there's actual value to citizens, value to businesses, value to cities in making these decisions? And then, clearly, like, if we look globally, different countries, different cities fall on different spectrums of this. So the same city model with different social inputs will have radically different outcomes. So like, I guess if you had to map forward five years, what do you think is the future of digital twin cities five years from now compared to where it is now compared to where it was five years ago? My inclination is that it's not a great predictive tool just because as humans, whenever we are faced with something, we always adapt. And so it's really hard to forecast out five years. I think in any type of forecasting or like time series modeling, the closer you are to the moment of now, it's going to be a lot more accurate. And so yes, maybe if it's like a short term um, prediction, it's going to be more accurate. But because in a city, every small action is going to create a larger um, I guess like a swing in what's going to happen in the predictability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, so for me, I don't know if, it shouldn't be a prediction, I think it could be scenarios because you can say these are the possible outcomes um, but I don't think it's really deterministic, necessarily. Um, and I think for now, we should focus on monitoring, which is a lot easier, and I think it responds to now. Um, and it's going to be, I think that's the first step before we even go into predicting, because I think that can get quite, I, I would not bet, <laughs> you know, like my last dollar on what happens five years from now on a model of like a whole city and what's gonna happen. That's for the researchers to figure out, but yeah, I think we need better understanding of urban systems. And so even before we start to predict like the whole city, I think we need to start saying, okay, what are the combinations of like the environment or like green infrastructure on like public use, like usage and real estate prices or whatever, right? So I think they're all, we have to start taking really small things so that we can get a better understanding about how these complex decisions or how these simple decisions are like part of this like complex system. And so I think this is a really one way of kind of getting to that knowledge. But right now, many of our um, research has been very um, siloed right now. And so whenever you want to go across the um, field, you have to really like find someone. And so hopefully this will start to open it up and give more complex understandings about what happens in urban systems. Okay. I'm Adam Paul Susnick, um, MARC uh, 20. Um, I work at ACOM um, on the pursuits and uh, government relations team. 
Um, and I run the project uh, Segregation by Design, um, in which I use uh, historic, er, uh, colorized historic photography um, and data to um, demonstrate how the United States used uh, housing and transportation policy to um, segregate the American city, um, to segregate the largest 180 specifically metropolitan areas. Um, this image, so I'm going to be showing images um, from various cities, not specifically New York, um, but because this, again, a lot, uh, the largest 180 cities, so it's a lot of them. And then you see that Housing Act of 1949, that guy's going to come up again. Um, how do I do next? Okay. Um, skip this one. Because the point of that slide is to say that the history is long and complicated. That's from the book of uh, that's from the book by Richard Rothstein, *The Color of Law*. Um, it's in the recording, and we can go back to take a picture. That's available online. Um, but so, what I want to focus on today is four key um, events, four key federal policies, and one um, real estate practice that created um, the incentives and funding mechanisms by which uh, the largest 180 cities essentially. Um, through automobile-based suburbanization, segregated the city again, um, and to some extent, um, it was an automobile housemanization of the largest 180 cities um, because of the, the scale involved. Um, so I'm gonna start sequentially with redlining. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, so redlining was a policy in, uh, during the New Deal um, created by uh, the federal government, they created the HOLC, which is the Homeowners Loan Corporation, um, for the purpose of shoring up um, the depression housing market. Um, what they did was they went neighborhood by neighborhood, um, uh, they went city by city, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, um, ranking or grading the residential security of each neighborhood explicitly based on race. Um, and you can see that in their comments. Uh, this is Oakland. Um, that, was, that was Brooklyn when I showed there, but this is Oakland. Um, and you can see even in the, um, even in the, uh, the, the, the cells they, they have for people to type into, what they're asking, um, what they're asking them to, uh, to, to record. Um, and what's interesting is some, this has occasionally been recast as, as, as um, commenting on the quality of the buildings. They do, in fact, in these notes, go into talking about the repair of the buildings. Um, and it, 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 the, the, the connection is, is pretty tenuous. Because um, you can see what ends up happening is the more racially integrated neighborhoods get red lines. So that's the red, I should explain the, uh, the, the grading system. So red and yellow is third and fourth grade. That's what they say is um, a neighborhood that has an infiltration of undesirable racial elements and then blue and yellow are third and fourth grade. Um, so the, what happens with the places that are redlined, um, the effect of this is to, so the point of this is the government is saying that these are risky investments. Um, so it's the government officially telling banks don't invest in red and yellow. So it's saying these areas, because of, their, um, because of the fact that they're racially integrated, that reduces the property values, um, and the effect of that is it becomes a feedback loop. So the tax bases get enervated, maintenance gets curtailed, services get canceled. Um, and then what this also facilitates is a practice um, known as blockbusting, in which um, real, estate uh, with, uh, real estate speculators, this is actually kind of a hard um, practice to describe because it sounds so cartoonish, um, in some of these more integrated areas, especially in the yellow areas, they would, in order to scare whites out, um, at, so what this said was that people of color reduce the property value. Um, so in the yellow areas, in order to scare whites out, is they would they do this practice called blockbusting, in which they would hire African Americans to just be walking on the street, in which they would, it, it, there's a good list on, on, on Wikipedia actually, but uh, uh, they would hire mothers and to, to walk down the street, it's, it's very deplorable. And they would dump trash and take pictures of it. Um, but so again, it becomes a feedback loop. Um, it, it encourages whites to flee where they are in these, um, what the, the folks that do live in, in yellow and red. This is Philadelphia, by the way, but again, it, it, it's, it's, it's um, uh, 
it's relatable to every city, um, applicable. Um, and in, in downtown Camden, you know, they note, they specifically, this is downtown Camden here, they note in the, in the redlining documents that the, this is the heart of the city, that the buildings are of good construction, um, but again, because it's, it's in the, I don't show it up here, but because it's 50% foreign born, 50% Negro, as they call it, um, it's redlined. Um, this is the Bronx, um, and you can see nearly all of it was in that third and fourth grade. Um, this is Buffalo. Uh, so this is Buffalo, the redlining map, you can see it still has a very strong correlation. So this is um, from the 2010 census data, they haven't updated this map yet. But um, you can see that the Hispanic area was once redlined, the white area was in that uh, fourth, first and second grade, and African American on the east side um, is incredibly segregated as we saw with the, the, the recent shooting. Um, and the, his motivation, et cetera. So moving on from redlining. So redlining sets the stage in which um, the inner city um, integrated neighborhoods are purposefully made to decay, again, because of that innervation of the tax bases um, due to artificially lowered property values. So what happens after World War II um, when all the drafted men come back, um, there is the GI Bill. Um, so the GI Bill basically gives them heavily subsidized, so it gives the millions of returning men um, heavily subsidized mortgages in the suburbs, um, so outside of the city center. Um, now, what's critical to note about that is there were many African Americans who served as GIs and in the um, military during World War II, but again, these the GI Bill gave them suburban um, suburban mortgages, and uh, suburban mortgages, or back in the day they had, so this is the real estate practice. So these new suburbs that were being built were bi being built with restrictive covenants, which is where, written into the lease, um, this is one of those leases, um, the picture got kind of screwed up, but written into the lease were racial restrictions. Um, pretty straightforward. So while the, the um, African Americans returning from the war were technically eligible and practiced, this, this wasn't for them. Um, so this created uh, so redlining created a sort of stick um, by uh, and purposefully allowing the inner cities to deteriorate, and then this creates uh, a carrot for white flight. Um, so those two, after the war, really create um, a policy-based white flight. Um, so and this is Levittown, you know, obviously very famous, um, and you know there was there was all sorts of um, benefits for veterans. Um, so. That's what creates um, white flight. Um, and then these next two, three, and four, the, federal, the 49 Housing Act and the 56 Freeway Bill, what these do is these give the cities who have had their downtown neighborhoods enervated by redlining and, and, and white flight, these give them new funding mechanisms to basically remake their downtowns um, for the purpose of attracting that crowd that has left, not necessarily for the purpose of attracting whites back downtown, not necessarily to live, but for commercial facilities. That's why we end up building um, giant um, sports facilities downtown. Um, and that's not the best example, but for instance, so the 49 Housing Act, what that does is it gives cities two thirds federal funding for slum clearance project. Um, and those are loosely defined. Um, and they're, the slum clearance projects, uh, what's defined as a slum is obviously built, or it is specifically built on those grades that were laid out in the redlining map. So this is building on the legacy of redlining. Um, and these ends up, so it's these neighborhoods that end up being targeted for slum clearance um, with two thirds federal funding. So this was downtown Boston, and this is when, um, you know, as we're architects here, this is when the modernism, the, 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 the ideologies of modernism and, and core sort of start getting actualized in the United States. Not to get into that, but these various cities, I, I focus a lot on Boston just because I have a lot of, I've recently covered it, but um, cities came up with these sort of whiz-bang space age plans to remake their downtowns um, for the purpose of attracting back suburban commuters. And what's interesting in the planning documents is you see this is this Boston in the planning documents, it, they stop referring, with, it, stop referring to it as the CBD, the Central Business District, and start referring to it as actually the Central Parking District, um, which kind of shows you something. And 
you know, for various reasons, these plans end up not living up to the, 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 the promises of, of their um, promoters, whether it be that the, our municipal, this is an ongoing project, so I'm, I'm speculating out loud here, whether it be that, it, you know, these municipalities didn't have the capacity to do such large projects, or in some cases, um, some, pro some projects were take, undertaken explicitly in bad faith. So this is the West End um, in Boston, which is this one here. Um, so it gets totally cleared out over the course of four years. Um, this is Roxbury, I'll get to that in a second. But so this is part of those, the, entirely funded by the 49 Housing Act. Um, this was a ploy by the, the, the city, the, the Boston government again to attract people back downtown. Um, and so this was an uh, Italian and Jewish neighborhood, actually Leonard Nimoy is from here. Um, and there's some great, from uh, Spock from Star Trek, there's some great um, interviews with him. And you know, all these people were led, so the government takes this land through eminent domain. Um, and sometimes there are plans, uh, but other times, so uh, I'm not doing a great job of explaining this. So they take this land through eminent domain and they told the residents that they would be rebuilding public, public housing, as much public housing, 10,000 people were displaced here. Uh, and they end up building about 300 units of housing um, in this area. After, after the BRA explicitly held press conferences saying that these people would be able to rel relocate back to this neighborhood. So in some cases, it's perhaps incompetence that, led, that leads to these projects failing, but in other cases, it is actually malice. Um, and for instance, this one is downtown Roxbury, um, or not downtown, uh, Nubian Square in Roxbury, which is the, on the city government, they call it the cultural capital of black Boston. So this is a famously a black neighborhood in Boston um, through eminent domain, they take all the, they see the, seize these properties, um, and they build a police station here. So this, and in the housing back here, these were sold. So they, so for this, for instance, they had a, they, they had a plan with eminent domain. They were going to build. They sold. They they took it and then they used it for public purposes. But so, so sometimes on these slum clearance projects, what they do is they'll do eminent domain to, and, and take the properties, demolish it, then they'd actually just sell it back to a private developer. So that's, for instance, what happens here in Philadelphia. But I'll get to that in a second. So, and sometimes the land just becomes, after these urban renewal projects, the land becomes basically worthless, so there's nothing you can, they just end up building parking lots um, as, as that becomes the best use of the land, or the most profitable. Um, and then in addition, you can see they also ripped out a subway line, but that's a long story. Um, so, yeah, um, and this is Philadelphia. Again, I'm talk talking about the 49 Housing Act. It, it, it created the funding mechanisms and incentives for cities to create these, I, I've already said this, but these sort of large-scale, houseman-like -like, um, redesigns based on um, automobiles. So, and again, this is Ed Bacon in, in um, Philadelphia, but he, he's not so important as, uh, because he's, Ed Bacon is there, Robert Moses. Doesn't matter, I'm talking more about like trends um, as incentivized by those two policies, sorry. Um, so again, in Philadelphia, it, it, these, much of this never ends up getting built. Um, much of these end up just becoming parking structures. Um, and again, another example of a project where they used eminent domain to seize this whole block and then sold it back to a private developer and then they, they didn't have, um, there was no incentive for them to actually rebuild the housing because they also ripped out the trolley line so it became hard to get there. Um, yeah. And then obviously here in New York we have our own fair share of um, harebrained schemes. So if, if it, this is Robert Moses, I'm sure everyone, most folks are familiar with him. He is the one who designed a lot of the highways. Um, in New York, um, in, this, in this presentation and in the project, I'm trying to talk a lot about trends um, as incentivized by these. Um, but, you know, there are um, important actors who do set trends. Uh, that was an aside. Um, but so, and then in 56 comes the, the Highway Act. Um, so remember, this provided two-thirds funding for slum clearance, which is loosely defined as basically the government being given permission to demolish formerly red line neighborhoods. Um, and then 56, so two thirds funding. So this 
90% um, funding um, for, for interstates. So let's say you have a, a main street in your town. If you want to do a road build, if you want to upgrade that main street, if you upgrade it to federal highway standards, the government will come in and give you 90%. So it, it, that, that's why we have such an orgiastic explosion of freeways everywhere, because it, it, it actually made sense, incentive sense, why it, it was money on the table. Um, and you can see this is the central artery being built in, um, in Boston. So the effect of these two, these two end up getting coupled together um, as both slum clearance and freeway building projects basically get joined. Um, this is the Bronx, before and after. Um, and they're able to double dip into that two thirds and 90% funding. Um, and it represents the largest investment in infrastructure the United States has ever done. Um, but, and again, where these freeways get routed is through, is to some extent, the government had a fiduciary obligation to choose the most, the cheapest routes. What were the cheapest routes? It was the areas that were redlined. Um, so it, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Prophecy, and that's why I like to talk about all four of these in unison. Because again, this reduced the property values, this caused white flight, um, and, and this trapped people of color in the center city, and these two destroyed the center city and made them accessible to the suburbs. Um, so this is the construction of um, the Cross Bronx Expressway in the Bronx, which displaced 60,000 people, which is the largest the most people displaced of, of any um, infrastructure project in American history. Um, and, you know, the, the, the effects are still being felt today. And uh, I'm almost finished. Um, the, it's not just that these communities were destroyed. They're also, this is like an open wound to some extent. You know, the tens of thousands of people that live along these highways face crisis level noise every day. Um, especially what I think is kind of funny in East Tremont is um, it's a big hill, so it's not like a dull roar of cars, it's like a grinding roar of trucks changing gears to go uphill. And then, no coincidence, the entire South Bronx, nearly every single census tract, is in the 99th percentile for asthma. Um, this is the last page, just as a PS. Um, uh, there's a book that came out, people ask me a lot why I do this as a you know, white dude. Um, there's a book that came out recently by Heather McGee, it's really good, it's called The Sum of Us. Um, so what, it's, it's about the, what uh, racist policies like this cost everybody. Um, so she uses the example, the central metaphor of the public swimming pool. Um, so similar to the, the 36, the redlining, during the New Deal, um, the federal government uh, through the WPA, funded the creation of public swimming pools in cities across the country. And this is back when public meant um, New York Public Library and not um, whatever Penn Station is now. Um, so they created these public swimming pools in cities across the country, St. Louis, Buffalo, all over the place. Big Beaux-Arts swimming pools, um, racially segregated, whites only. Um, in the 50s, um, when the Supreme Court cases start coming down that desegregate, these pools uh, are ordered to desegregate many cities, St. Louis and many others, specifically in order to avoid integration. They, they drain the swimming pools and they demolish them. Um, they're gone. Uh, and then subsequently after that, you see the rise of backyard swimming pools in single family homes. Um, so the point of that, the point of her metaphor there is they took what was, in the name of segregation, they took what was previously a public good that we all had access to, they privatized it. Um, and they made it for people who had single family homes. Um, and one of the reasons I started this project, I used to joke and say I was wondering where the trams went, but it's, I think it's similar to the, the public pool. This is a map of Philadelphia's transit in the 30s versus 2022. Um, these routes have been replaced with buses, but each of these routes was five minutes or better, um, and the buses are not the same. Um, and then in New York, you know, I was trying to figure out why in God's name would they demolish the Third Avenue L, which is now gone. Um, and, and this is one of the, the BX-19, I think it is, is the busiest bus route in the city. Um, so it was about this destruction of, 
or what the reason I was interested in is because it was about the, I'm interested in the destruction of public space in the name of racism, which is fascinating. Um, so this is where I'm going to end. These are a bunch of sources. If you want to take a picture of this slide, that QR code also goes to my Patreon. So if you want to support me on Patreon. No, I've covered 12. So, um, and it's, what's fun about the project is, um, you'll see, I did the Bronx a while ago, and it's before I learned how to do colorization. Um, so it's kind of fun with each city, I just, you know, and the colorization gets like better. And the point of the colorization is um, comparative clarity. You know, before I was making everything black and white, you know, like even the modern photos, because it's, it's just tough in my mind to compare black and white to, um, Colored, so, you know. And these, you know, I figure I'll meet halfway. I'll desaturate this and then slightly saturate that. You know. But yeah, I've covered about 11 cities. Oh, I meant to show a video. So. So I make, I do animations like this as well. Supposed to be high dev. So this is the construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway. So again, this is placed about sixty thousand. Yeah, I got one for like Philly too, but, but uh, and Boston. But. The website, if anyone's interested. The, so, that's the ones I've done so far are okay: Atlanta, Boston, Buffalo, Bronx, DC, Houston, Minneapolis, Oakland, Philly. About it. Uh, I do vote on my Instagram. Oh, I mean, it's so the project start, so the intent is to create a book with basically each of these as like a chapter, it's like an atlas. Um, but just as I started an Instagram as a way to like gamify it for me, so now I can like get a lot of feedback and like get a lot of praise every time I post, which is great. I have 80,000 followers. I encourage you all to follow me. 80,000 across Twitter and Instagram. AOC follows me. Pretty um, but the way I pick, I just do sometimes a vote. Like, next I'm just doing Chicago, because my analytics tell me that I have a bunch of followers there. Um, you know, there's some that are special, like Tulsa, um, and here, that I have to break down. I mean, special for historic reasons. I shouldn't say that, because they're all special. But, um... But the bigger ones are, like, New York I broke down. I'm doing five. Well, four. <laughs> I'll do Staten Island eventually. But, uh, and then L.A., like, I don't even know how I'm going to tackle that. But Chicago I'm probably going to do next. But n the, the order is just how I want to do it. The video's about the federal highway with the highway. Isn't it also true that they um, built these highways through these red line areas, but there weren't any exits on these highways to these areas? So those, uh, those areas became completely isolated and even more divestment because you couldn't even get off the highway to like drive through there. I don't have to pull um, that up. Yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, the Cross Bronx, a little less so, um, which actually is a problem because it, it floods the streets with um, cars. And actually, a real problem on the Cross Bronx is the cr 
I have, the Cross Bronx, I talk, we do stuff at work, so I have a lot. Of, but the Cross Bronx is also a main trucking route for the Northeast Corridor, and that's because we discontinued freight rail on the different issue. But um, it's one of the main trucking routes, and because there's so much traffic there, um, oftentimes truckers will hit their hours, and they have to drive off into the Bronx and just park in the like in front of a house or an apartment building. Um, I don't remember why they bring that up. Oh, the exits, yeah. Um, whereas someplace like um, like Camden, like. Uh, You really see, um, so that's before, and then that's after. Yeah, that's not the greatest example, but they demolished the whole downtown and turn off. Well, Baltimore special. No, um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, right, let me just show you. I said Baltimore, so maybe I did. Uh, this is just. Yeah. Well, why I'm not trying to offer solutions necessarily is um, I'm not from any of these places. Um, and it's one thing for me to talk about the history. That's a little dicey itself. But I mean, one of the, I think I, I think actually coming as an outsider to these cities is kind of an advantage for me to some extent because um, there's all these narratives that pop up around projects. Um, should not try to do two things at once. Um, well, I'm not trying to offer solutions because I don't know what's best for the community. Um, you know, for instance. Buffalo has, they have, uh, I'll show you. Buffalo had a linear park designed by, um, by uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, a linear park, unfortunately, is a great place for a highway. So they, they put a highway, right, well, it's not a great place for these, think, you know, the people in the 50s. So they, they demolished the, the Humboldt Parkway. They built a, a, a highway over it. Um, their ongoing plans talking about capping or removal, I, Obviously, well, I favor removal entirely. I don't think these things are necessary. They induce cars. That's a whole different issue. Um, and that's one of the reasons. Never mind. Sorry. Um, the community, though, uh, the people who live there, there's this organization called, I don't know, I shouldn't call it. The, the people who live there, though, they're in favor of capping. Um, so I don't want to get into that. Because um, not what I'm doing here. I'm trying to talk about history, because um, people always ask if I'm talking about gentrification, no. I'm talking about the processes, or the, 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 the history that led up to their being the, na the ability for gentrification to happen. Um, yeah, but so no. <laughs> Like you mentioned, there's an Instagram following. I was curious if you had previous collaborations or from cities or yeah. you know, at ACOM who have, in a way, used this as an assessment just to, in a way, drive their projects or... Absolutely, so... Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Well, um, and that's actually back to your earlier, because like, that informs sometimes how I pick cities. Um, like I did Houston because there was this, there's this thing going on. Um, there's this... So, and, and this is where I am willing to talk about present day, because I'm just saying this is bad. So it's easy for me to say no to something that hasn't been done yet. Or, so this is a planned freeway expansion. And um, um, that's going to take out, like, um, um, but so I was, I was working with a group there, um, Stop PX. The group's not great name, but uh, they're, they're awesome people. Stop TX 10 something something. Um, so yeah, I, I gave them some materials that they had presented at um, uh, like uh, community meetings uh, and, and text dot stuff because the text dot website 
obviously doesn't have a clear map intentionally. They don't want to show people what the hell they're going to do. It's, ma it's madness. Um, and a key part of this project, I'm not saying that these people are racist. Um, I'm saying that all the incentives that led to this um, at, created a system where it's going to be all Hispanic people that get displaced here. Um, so participating in that process is kind of just... Um, it's, it's, it's insanity. You know, they're going to take out this whole thing. Um, and then, like, uh, there was another city, Buffalo. I was, well, well then, that was different. Um, and then Portland has an ongoing expansion. Um, what was the question? Sorry. They use this as well as resources just to build on top of, like, projects or development plans that they had. Um, because I know you mentioned you have an Instagram following. I'm sure you could also have a following of some of other city, city planning departments. Or oh, whatever. totally. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Okay. Okay. So I gave a presentation well. at the, I work with Preservation Alliances. Okay. Um, although I don't necessarily always agree with them. They love brutalism. Um, the style is fine. It's what, they built the, it's what they built those buildings on top of. The building is almost pointless to talk about. Um, I'm talking specifically about Boston City Hall. It's like, because you see how dense the neighborhood was, and, they, and that, that's it there. It's like, you know, it's, it's madness. Um, yeah, I work with the Preservation Alliances, um, and yeah, I have an exhibit. I worked with the Mailman School at here. Um, Professor Peter Munich, um, we have an exhibit up in, well, and with uh, Michael Bell, um, who, who uh, is a, prof a professor here. Um, he did a studio about capping the Cross Bronx, so I, I contributed some work to that. Um, not about the capping part, because I think it should be removed, but, um, well, no, they should drop a train in there and build on top of it. timeline part lays out like it took 20 years to a degree 10 15 20 years for a lot of the policies to come into place and then you know this is all played out then over 30 60 even continuing to play out between these tensions of car centricity and non car centricity yeah. given there's been a, a material shift in the last 20 ish years uh, at a planning policy level like city governments and state government levels do you see this methodology being applicable now to like to log maybe ten years out, see how Buffalo might look different, or how California is. They make decisions and changes about cars to be more rail. Like, so we can see kind of the reverse happening, or like there's been a lot of like urban density investments now happening sometimes from private industry. I'm just curious, do we see kind of the reverse trend starting to play out as well? Or it's gotten worse. It's gotten worse. Right. So Significantly worse. That's a great question. Before you answer, do you? Maybe this will be the last, just in the interest of time, um, and then we can move on to, but I hope you're going to stay for lunch, and, and yeah. maybe, you know, yeah. there's obviously a lot of interest in your projects, so people can sure. continue chatting with you. Uh, can I do one? Yeah. Yep. Um, what did you just say? You were saying it's getting worse. Oh, it's getting worse. Um, oh, right. Material shift. No, rhetorical shift. It has not been a material shift. Um, in fact, Cal Democrats, Cal trans, not dot, Caltrans, they cut um, public, fan, public transit funding by 18%, raised freeway expansion about 30. So no, um, there's been a rhetorical shift, sure, but absolutely not a material shift. And where we do spend our money making that material shift actualized is on crap. It's on, it's on um, Moynihan train hall. It's on, um, it, it, it's on massive... Um, stations for the Second Avenue subway rather than completing it and not... The stations are the most expensive part of a subway um, and they made them, they're far too large. Um, but it, where, we, where we spend money is silly. Um, absolutely, nothing has changed. Um, the trend is going in the wrong direction. We're the most segregated we've ever been. Uh, yeah, um, it's not good. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to end on such a bummer. Jeez. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah. The, what do I have planned? Oh, I'm going to finish doing the rest of the cities. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to keep doing the cities. Um, next is Chicago. Oh, I'm applying for a PhD. Is that what? Yeah. 